Hi, Adam. Uh, uh, so uh, you're an architect, is that correct? Hi, Dane. Thanks for having me today. Uh, yes, I'm an architect. I actually just uh, went off my own and on my own and opened my own boutique architectural practice last year. I'm based in the Silicon Valley in the South Bay area, and I'm focusing right now on uh, smaller projects uh, such as home remodels, single family residences, uh, missing middle housing, accessory dwelling units, and some small lot infill development. So uh, it's an exciting time for me, especially since I've, you know, I've been an architect for over a decade, but it's been working at larger corporate firms, which, you know, has been a great learning yeah. experience. I've got to work on some really cool buildings over the years, but, you know, finally decided I had enough experience under my belt to, to go off on my own. Yeah. Um, I, I figure it might uh, be an interesting time to be pivoting, I guess it sounds like, away from corporate toward uh, home dwellings and personal residencies with uh, the whammy that COVID seems to have laid upon commercial real estate, you know, lately. Yeah, I mean, my personal journey, uh, you know, during the COVID pandemic has sort of followed larger trends. Like when the pandemic started, I was living with my now wife in a condo in downtown San Francisco. Oh, yeah. And as as we all know, we, we know what happened. Everyone left or many people left the city, especially the downtown area. It still today remains a ghost town there. It's, it's kind of sad to see, actually, you know, because I, I really love I, I genuinely love San Francisco. I think it's a great city, but it's going through some hard times right now. And uh, yeah. we we just decided, OK, let's, you know, let's find a nice place that, you know, we both like that still has sort of the uh culture and amenities that we prefer but that's not like in the middle of the city so we we came to the south bay actually which we're both fr from and we're actually back in my hometown uh called uh los gatos i don't know if you've heard of it it's where netflix yeah. is headquartered has a really nice walkable downtown area uh it's kind of nestled into the santa cruz mountains so it i think it was a nice uh change so naturally the the sort of work that's uh happening here are, are the the single family residential market is booming and not just in terms of uh, you know it's it's pretty built out down here it's not like texas or florida where there's more space and there's more uh, mcmansion sprawl happening it's it's pretty built out but there are a lot of post-world war ii single family homes in, in the south bay in the in the san jose area that are sort of reaching the end of their uh, life and need a lot of uh, sort of rethinking about uh, how the floor plans and layouts are arranged. And now a lot of uh, families, especially there are a lot of uh, immigrant families from East Asia, South Asia that work in the technology sector here who, you know, have lots of money because they have, you know, good jobs at uh, the large tech firms around here. Uh, who are more open to like multi generational household living. So it's very interesting to see uh, these types of people starting to take on sort of uh, accessory dwelling unit projects in, the, in, in terms of, you know, adding on to an existing single family home or converting a detached garage and, and making that a space for, you know, uh, grandma and grandpa or, you know, relatives when they vi visit from out of the country. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Yeah, so that's the term accessory dwelling unit if you're in the biz for like, uh, you know, a um i almost said a pool house but then that presupposes a pool i guess correct yeah i mean you can you can if you have a pool house you can convert that into an accessory dwelling unit cool yeah yeah sometimes i wonder about uh because you, know, you can't see people's backyards very easily uh just driving down the street i wonder how many residencies i see actually have like an additional half residency you know hiding in the back i wonder sometimes in berkeley you know there's a lot of a uh, uh, single family you know uh single floor homes but they've got uh, some decent backyards, kind of a legacy holdover from uh, booming prior times. And um, I figure they have some nice, I've seen a few, they have some nice things going on in the back there as far as additional places. What is equivalent essentially to like a, you know, a studio apartment kind of hiding in the back. Well, it's interesting. These things used to be more popular, like pre-World War II, it was more common. And you'd also see in single family neighborhoods, you would see more missing middle housing sort of inserted in between single family homes. And I'm talking, you know, like duplexes, fourplexes, 
uh, this sort of thing. But now with the housing crisis and especially the emptying out of the urban centers and people moving back to the suburbs, there's this sort of momentum toward going back to the pre-World War II sort of mixed single family um, neighborhoods that have small missing middle housing. Now, obviously there's there are the people who have lived in the suburbs since you know the 70s and 80s uh, who are not that excited about this paradigm. They hear the uh, the new uh, state legislation passing in, in, in Sacramento for California, for instance, like the Senate Bill 9 and the Senate Bill 10, which just uh, are now enacted in law as of January 1st this year, uh, which are sort of incentivizing local jurisdictions to densify single family neighborhoods. OK, yeah, it, hasn't that been um, mostly the handiwork of, of, a, of a single senator or a, a yeah, state senator, Scott Wiener? Is that it? Yeah, I mean, Scott Wiener has definitely been the leader in, in housing reform legislation in California. And I know he's worked since he's been in the state Senate, you know, over a number of years to. You know, get the state legislature sort of on board with with his arguments, but you know, it, it it's a statewide problem. It's now a nationwide problem, and it's actually an international problem now as well. Are the the you know the high cost of housing and how younger generations aren't able to afford uh, places to live. So I think there are smart uh, you know levers we can pull at a legislative level to incentivize. Uh, more density, but when I say density, I, I I don't mean like you know skyscrapers, high rises, you see in you know Soma or something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the smaller missing middle stuff, which you can actually, as you pointed out, insert sort of discreetly into the backyard, perhaps or behind a house, without changing the sort of public street facing character of these neighborhoods. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Uh, it seems as if, you know, COVID has, has, has dealt a quiet blow to that entire uh, effort at new urbanism, you know, rendering it almost quasi obsolete. I mean, how, how uh, you know, interested are people now in living right next to a BART station somewhere in, you know, Central Bay Area? Uh, I still think they're pretty, pretty interested. Um, and, you know, even with a massive transition to uh, work from home, I, I still think people would would like to make their home in that kind of central district and, and so all of these new urbanist efforts might still matter but um i think it is a setback it's it's sort of like a covid represented a bit of a holding pattern to people you know kind of living at home maybe on the verge of uh, moving into a, an urban area now they might just kind of hang on living with their parents even longer so i don't know what, what do you think as far as the future of that goes well, in terms of the bigger developments you kind of see in the suburban areas outside of san francisco especially you're talking about BART and I know uh, recently BART opened the new uh, station in, in San Jose, Berryessa, and there have been uh, some pretty large scale uh, residential developments, apartment developments in, around the station. And then also I think in Fremont, in the southern part of uh, Fremont, there's also some, I, I remember going there a few months ago and just seeing this giant new apartment complex and, you know, from a planning point of view and an architectural point of view, I think having really high density near transit stops, you know, transit oriented development, it, it makes sense. Um, but it's it's a pretty stark contrast between, like, say, at the Fremont station, when you go from this huge new block development and then you walk across the street and it's all single family homes. I'm kind of interested in seeing or I would like to see more somewhere in between those two polar opposites. Yeah, it's interesting when you see, uh, you know, a BART train juxtaposed with, you know, how is single family housing built in, you know, 1971 or something you know, directly across the street. Uh, I mean, I say it's just interesting to see it juxtaposed, but others think it's an eyesore and that actually gets to a lot of the uh, debate over um, infilling areas and changing the, the so-called character of a neighborhood. The notion of a character of a neighborhood is pretty subjective. What do you think of that notion? Is it not so objective after all, if, if you kind of uh, looked into what people refer refer to when they say that or, or what they implicitly mean? Or what do you think about that character of a neighborhood, that phrase? 
usually when you go to say a city or town planning meeting and you hear a NIMBY is speaking saying that they oppose the development because it'll change the character of the neighborhood. I think it's really rooted in not so much aesthetics, but a sense of nostalgia in the sense that I like the way the neighborhood was when I bought here, you know, whether that was 10 years ago, whether that was 30 or 40 years ago, there's something about setting roots in a place and wanting to preserve the way it is when you got there that makes you sort of hesitant about new changes that come to the neighborhood. So I, I, to me, it's less about aesthetics, even and urbanism and more about nostalgia, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I was about to say, and yet, um, uh... You know, a, a former Macy's department store that is now empty 10 months out of the year. The other two months is a spirit Halloween store. <laughs> we all kind of feel like we could all, even if it is subjective, we all agree that's kind of shitty looking. But that really right. is uh, what people mean by uh, you know, that. That's what happens, in fact, when they stop having city council meetings about what's going to happen to an area. That's what ha that's what happens just kind of by default when an area is experiencing kind of a downturn in the economy, I think. But uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I linked to you an article about how working from home is bringing some, uh, allegedly bringing some kind of urban amenities to the suburbs. Have you seen any of that in the South Bay, which is, I kind of think of ex existing, uh, sort of in between a let's get out of the urban areas and go to Truckee and Soma, you know, I, I see it existing sort of in between that. So you might be seeing some of what they're getting out there. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Truckee. Uh, Robert Stark calls the, what happens in Truckee uh, the development there ski lodge urbanism, which I yeah I, I thought was funny. Uh, well, the South Bay is interesting because it is mostly you know a post World War II developed area defined by sprawl, you know, not very good transit, um, single family homes, but at the same time the economy is very strong here. I mean, this is the home of you know Google, Apple. Facebook, Netflix, these, you know, huge international, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, you know, who's who've generated more wealth than, you know, any organization has ever seen in the history of humanity. Yet you come to the South Bay and you're like, ah, oh, this is really the center of global capital here. There's <laughs> it doesn't look that interesting. But the truth is, there are interesting things happening on the ground. Um like, let's just take uh, the town of Cupertino, for instance, where Apple is headquartered. So you have the big spaceship donut, their new headquarters, which is has been empty because everyone's working from home. Oh, yeah. Uh, what a shame. And, <laughs> I know. I mean, beautiful, bu beautiful building, but no putting one's there. No politics and whatever you think about Apple and the bigger scheme of things, just as far as that project goes, that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> a gorgeous building. I mean, uh, but no one's there. No one's using it. The public can't access it. But then you go a few blocks south on uh, one of the main veins through Cupertino called Stevens Creek Boulevard, and you have all these little sort of mid-century strip malls. Yeah. But what's interesting about these strip malls is they're all full of small Asian businesses. So, you know, Japanese shabu shabu places, boba shops, Korean barbecue, Japanese markets, yeah. and it's just really interesting to, to go there and shop and you kind of get this rich, like diverse cultural experience just in these kind of ramshackle random strip malls. So uh, there, there's there's this, and I think part of the reason that small uh, immigrant businesses are able to thrive in those sort of buildings or places is because, you know, you know the rents are more affordable than say like a brand new development with like a retail space, for instance. So, and then the, the other interesting thing happening in the South Bay is, is downtown San Jose, which is kind of, you know, historically been a, somewhat of a ghost town. But now there are all these plans because Google has uh, huge uh, plans and they, they have the rights now to develop uh, the area around the Caltrain station there, Diridon station. So there, I've seen a lot of interesting renderings for plans and new buildings around that area, but we'll see, uh, you know, yeah. what comes with that. Big um, 
the uh, tech dinosaurs, as they call them, sort of, you know, Web 1.0 legacy companies, the Google, uh, Yahoo, places like that. They their main headquarters, their main home base is in the South Bay, but they'll open up sort of like uh, smaller offices in San Francisco proper. Uh, they're able to weather this better than, say, a Twitter who you know, I think Twitter is entirely San Francisco. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting. What, what's that main street going up? Uh, I think it might extend almost the entire length of the peninsula. El Camino. Yeah, El Camino. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Driving along that is interesting. You know, you'll see a car wash from the '60s, and then a strip mall. Yeah, and then you'll drive right by a, a big new glass building, a LinkedIn HQ or something like that. Uh, I I haven't been down in the South Bay, you know, basically since COVID started, and uh, I've lived out in the Bay Area for a long time, but I've I've started to lose my bearings a little bit and forget where things are. <laughs> it's sort of sad. Yeah, I mean, the Bay Area is interesting because we have the Bay in the middle of it. So we're, we're kind of a little bit disjointed in a way, the East Bay and especially the peninsula. I mean, San Francisco was great because it sort of brought together, the, you know, you could access it easily from the East Bay or if you lived in Marin County or Sonoma for the, to the north and then obviously tying down to the peninsula and the South Bay. But there doesn't seem any sort of, I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I don't see like Soma and mid market in downtown San Francisco recovering anytime soon. I think uh, uh, there, there is a big narrative about people left for, you know, Austin and Miami and other cities. But yeah, I personally, in my circle of friends, I know a lot of people who moved like we did to the South Bay or to the peninsula, for instance. Yeah. I, I have to imagine a far, you know, larger number of people are moving uh, away from you know where they currently where they were but not as far away as you know austin or it, it's quite an uprooting you know for a lot of people and i mean even even you know, people in their 20s i think would find it much more agreeable to stay as close as you can um but yeah i mean i myself am, am going to miami and uh COVID is not the primary reason but if it weren't for the work from home revolution that got kicked off by that i, I couldn't do it um uh, and i guess with that uh we can pivot to uh topic i was hoping to get into comparative urbanism uh which is a little broad but uh one aspect of that i thought was interesting is uh, east coast cities that have certain characteristics that feel more like west coast cities and, and perhaps vice versa um and i looking at miami um, the, the uh, kind of metro area i thought it interesting it, it reminded me a lot of uh southern california actually and they even have a lot of the same names there's a hollywood um, down there and uh, at, uh, another city that it shares with uh, Southern California, city name it shares. So, yeah, so we got Miami that is uh, quite blue despite being in a red state. And it, it also happens to look like Southern California, although I, I, I think it's going to feel a lot worse come, uh, come summer. That's something I'll find out. But, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, just the general, let's say the general kind of aesthetic feel, kind of real feel of the urban environment on the East Coast versus the West. Do you have any any, any thoughts there? even better or maybe not even better or worse just purely descriptively different in an interesting way yeah well let's start with uh, the two cities you just compared uh like los angeles to miami and i, I feel like those cities are all are, are they're kind of their own thing and, and they do have similarities for sure you know i spent uh a, you know about six years in la that's where i went to architecture school so i'm very familiar with los angeles and to be honest, I've only been to Miami once. That was about five or six years ago. I, I really enjoyed Miami. I thought it was an amazing city. But you're right. I think it, the weather can get, I mean, I do well with, I do fine in dry heat, but it does get super humid there in the summer as well as hot. <laughs> so you go outside and you're already like drenched in sweat. But it's, that being said, it, it is, it's nice that you can, you know, walk year round in, you know, shorts and flip flops. But uh, in terms of the urban sort of character, both LA and Miami, unfortunately, are you know still auto dependent uh, cities. You you pretty much need a car to get around. I think, I think this the percentage of people who commute by public transit is somewhat similar. I think in in uh, Miami, I read it was like about ten percent of people, only ten percent of people go by public transit to to commute to work. But I think the difference is that. Miami, Miami feels like its own world in a way, like it's kind of at the southern end, you know, it's at the southern, southern end of Florida, and it's very different from the rest of Florida, and it's very different from the rest of the US. And it's really informed by, you know, Latin America, by, you know, the Caribbean, and also South America has a lot of influence on, on the city. Um, so, 
I mean, I have a lot more to say about Miami, but I don't know if you wanted to chime in since you're moving there. What what what, what, what excites you about Miami? I guess I'm just going to ask. Um, I don't believe uh, light rail. Any, I mean, I mean, I, I know they don't have a subway, and that would just be a bad idea anyway. I think I it's possible. Think it would, yeah, sea level and the sinkholes and stuff. I don't even think it would be very tenable. But do they have anything like a light rail in Miami or a tram system? Well, they have. It's interesting because I, I think in downtown Miami. Actually, I know in downtown Miami because I've been on it. There's this. I'm not sure what they call it. It's like a, it's a people mover. Huh. It's called a metro mover, people mover. And it's this elevated rail that takes you through the high rises of downtown. And you get these really cool views of the buildings and the water. But um, okay. I remember, I didn't, I, there were a few people on it, but I don't remember it being like, you know, a massive commuter rail or something. For getting around downtown, I think it's pretty convenient. But then I think they also have a, a, uh, like the Miami Dade County Metro Rail, which I think is is more akin to like a Caltrain, like a commuter rail. Okay, so they have they have something, but it's a bit of a public transportation novelty item. It sounds like. Yeah, 